this is Mandy Fury at My Creative Kingdom. I thought I would talk to you about what it's like to make video lessons for early learners. For those of you that know me, you know that I teach all day kindergarten and this is um, just finishing up my seventh year in teaching. I'm going into my eighth. I'm a national board certified teacher. I have my master's degree in both teaching as well as social work. And so a lot of what I do comes from that kind of a uh, lens. Um, as we know, teaching online is not ideal, especially when it comes to teaching early learners because early learners need a lot of hands-on activities and their attention span is so, so short. So one of the questions that you might have when you're doing your online lessons is what to focus on and how long does it need to be? So some of the lessons I've seen out there are 20 minutes long, 30 minutes long. That is much too long for a kindergartner, at least a kindergartner, to sit at home and sit in front of a television to watch for that period of time just to see us do direct instruction. That is way too long. So my idea and my recommendation is to keep it to about 10 to 15 minutes at most. Most of my lessons are about 10 minutes and that's it. And I can go through quickly so that if they want to go back and review, they can do that. Now kindergarten, you have the opportunity to go slower, but you can also go faster. We know that kindergarten, those early learners really do a great job when it comes to lots of transitions. So let's talk about first um, again, let's review duration, okay? So again, we want to keep our duration very short. That works to your favor. That means that you don't have to be on camera for very long. And I don't know about you, but I have never done any YouTube videos prior to this distance learning. Um, I have had my own business for a long time, um, as well as my teaching career, and I always distanced from YouTube. Um, but I had to get over that because my kids needed me. So now here I am and just trying to offer the help and support that I can. So duration, again, for those early learners, and I'm thinking kindergarten through second grade, you want to keep it short, no longer than 10 minutes, 15 at the very, very most. And why I say that is because they're already going to be watching a lot of TV and doing a lot of online activities. There's no personal interaction where there would be if you were doing a lesson inside the classroom. We thrive on that conversation. So if they're going to sit there and listen to you talk for that amount of time, Okay, or are expected to listen to someone else talk even if you have interviews in there with other children, let's say, it's just not feasible to do a 20 minute lesson. Really, it needs to be about 10 minutes, 15 minutes at the most. Think five minutes for your intro, five minutes for the middle, five minutes for the end. And honestly, that's how I teach my lessons at the beginning of the school year in kindergarten. So again, attention span small means less time on camera for you. Now here's the tricky part. To keep kids engaged, you might want to think about some other multimedia materials that you can use to help hook them into your learning. You don't have to use things like animation. That's just something I've been playing around with. Um, I grew up with a mom who is a artist and so I got all of her computers handed down to me. So I already had a lot of the software for my own business. You don't need to do that. In fact, there's a really easy way that you can add multimedia to your videos. You can go to Pixabay or Pexels.com. Pexels it is P-E-X-E-L-S and Pixabay is P-I-X-A-B-A-Y. And in there you can find images that you can use inside your video and show them and without any sort of fear of copyright infringement. So what that means is that they're not just royalty free, they're also public domain images, which means you can use them across the internet. Okay, that is a lot better, especially if you're going to be posting your videos on the YouTube or another channel platform and people are going to be accessing it, you wanna make sure that you're not infringing on someone else's rights or property rights because that can come back to get you later. So Pixabay, Pexels.com, they're royalty free and they're also public domain. 
So those are the places you will want to go. You'd be amazed by that. Just adding some of those images inside there will really help you out. Okay, so one example of this is I'm making social studies videos. Okay, and social studies lesson videos. At the very beginning, I have a world going in um, a circular motion. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to make a really cool animation like that. I went on the website, found it, and just put a title over the top saying social studies and then colon and the lesson title. And it makes it look so much more professional and engaging for kids. And you can splice that inside your video. We'll get to editing later. Okay, probably in a different video, but this is just talking about content and some ideas about what you can do to help engage your kids. Okay, so you've got your duration. Keep it short, keep it short, keep it short. Okay, your content. What do you want to include inside your video? Well, it's going to be important that what you include in your content is going to be what you want kids to take away. You don't need to include every little single bit inside there of what you need. Okay, so one of the things that you're going to want to look at is narrowing down your content to the very basic material. What is the basic vocabulary term? What is the basic learning target? Very, very simple that you want your kids to learn. So an example would be I did a lesson on expanding sentences. And the word that I wanted them to really focus on because they need to know what an expanded sentence is before they can actually accomplish it is the word expanded. So every time I used the word expanded in my video, I put a little clip of expanded and it looks like it was stretching out. It's me and our learning goal. Okay, now I still focused on what an expanded sentence looked like. And when you're doing a lesson and you're recording it and there's no children in front of you, you kind of have to roll with the punches and you really have to anticipate what their responses might be. So what I did is I literally just sat in a chair, set up my computer, which might not always be the best videotaping platform, I realize, because you can see my glasses in the reflection um, or see my computer in the reflection of my glasses, but that's okay. You use what you have, right? Sat down and I taught the way that I would when I'm modeling a lesson. So if you focus on the modeling part of the lesson, still give wait time and wait as if you would in a classroom to see what their responses would be. Then inside your head, think about what are some things that they might have said. Then go ahead and anticipate those and feed those in your responses. Okay, but that wait time should still be there even when you're modeling a lesson so that they have a chance to think and you're still not just feeding them all of the responses that you want them to have. Now your wait time might be a little bit shorter. Another thing that you can do, again, I don't have video and don't know how to do it necessarily, on a clock. Okay, while you're doing your video and during the wait time, you could splice your video and just include the picture of a clock. It doesn't even have to be a video. It can just be a photograph that just sits there so that they know that they have to wait and think about what it is that your question was. Then you move on. Okay, the next thing that you're going to want to focus on and is really important is to be flexible. We're not teaching in a studio. Most of us don't have a place set up just for doing YouTube videos. Most of us don't have a classroom we can go into at this time because we're not allowed into our buildings. So we don't necessarily have the access in the space and we've got kids at home and we've got pets. On my end, I have pets and I have a daughter at home. And so sometimes what happens in the middle of my video is you're going to see my cat or my dog. In fact, most of the time they are in those videos and I'm surprised I don't have anyone here right now. So just roll with the punches. Maybe I've been watching a little bit uh, too much at Food Network Star and those reality shows, but you just roll with the punches. What happens when all the lights go off? You, If you're on live TV, you just roll with what you have. This will keep you from making several videos and feeling frustrated that you're not getting it perfect every single time. Nobody is expecting perfection. In fact, what your kids want to see most is you. They want to feel like they're still connected. So as much as I hate doing videos because I really don't like it, 
I'm learning to enjoy it. I'm learning to enjoy the fact that my kids feel connected and are excited when they see me on the screen. I feel excited that they feel connected even when I'm not there with them every single day. I know that they can go to a YouTube video on the computer and still see me. And I'm starting to feel like maybe this is a good way to engage students at home even after distance learning might go away. We really don't know our future. It's very uncertain. But creating YouTube videos are something I'm going to be able to use for a long time. So taking the time to make them and also just adding some of those little elements like making sure you give wait time. And did I say it again? Keep it short. Okay? Keep it short, 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 short. Okay? And focusing in on the modeling of the lesson. You're not going to be able to assess on a video. Okay? And you're not going to get student responses unless you're videotaping kids separately and even then that opens up a whole nother can of worms. So focus on the modeling of your lesson and focus in on narrowing in on what is most important for them to learn. You still want to teach those extra skills, but think about what is most important. The great thing about a video, unlike being in the classroom, is they can go back and rewatch that video as many times as they need. And also keep in mind, a lot of my parents are watching these videos too because they say, I don't know how to teach my kindergartner. And one of the areas that my parents uh, really struggle with, and even a lot of teachers do, is writing. So this also isn't just for kids, even though I'm teaching it for kids, it's for parents too, because then that way, they are also getting the language they need to help prompt their kids at home. So in a lot of ways, this has been a really good opportunity in some ways to get closer to our families. Um, a little bit more advice, facial expressions. <laughs> this is really hard right now because I'm videotaping my lesson on my computer and usually I can see my facial expressions, which is why I like videotaping this way. Um, but I'm frozen right now, so I'm not sure what my facial expressions look like, but that is another reason why I like videotaping on my computer. What I will do is have a cart, set up a little uh, book stand on top, and then put my computer on top and then find a place to sit, usually uh, by the brick over here because it's the only focus area in this room that actually has some sort of appeal. You might not be able to tell, but I'm in an attic bedroom and so if I were to stand up right now, I would bonk my head and that would hurt really bad and trust me, it does because I've bonked my head many, many times. So what you want to do is make sure that when you're teaching your young learners on the computer, you over exaggerate your expression. You have to be super excited. Kids need that anyway because they're learning what your expression is, but they especially need it when you're trying to teach through a computer screen. That is extremely difficult to do, but when you smile and you have the exaggerated looks and the excitement and your voice intonation changes, the kids follow along with that. You might feel silly, but you're not making these videos for adults, you're making them for kids. So keep that in mind. And you know what, I don't know about you, but I just kind of forget that they're on the computer, so then that way I don't feel silly and I don't have to go back and look at them. <laughs> because, I don't know, I'm one of those people that uh, would do a brain break in the classroom and be goofy with my five-year-olds because it was really easy to do, but the minute an adult walks in, you're kind of embarrassed. So just keep in mind that yes, people are watching it. Nobody is judging you for how silly you look. Your kids are watching you and want to see you. So facial expressions, over exaggerated, your kids need that. They're learning those social emotional cues from you even through video and it keeps their engagement level high. So keep it simple, be flexible, keep it short and don't worry about practicing several times. If you make a mistake, you make a mistake. If your cat jumps up on your lap, or I think in one of my videos, my cat is walking along the banister, oh well, just include it inside your lesson. I just tell my kids, my pets are so excited that I am at home that they like to pretend that they're my students. And you know what? When I watch these videos with my kids on Zoom, they love it. 
They absolutely love it. So just roll with the punches. If you hear the lawnmower in the background like I do now, just roll with the punches. Everyone is at home. It's okay. So I hope that these are some great tips that you'll be able to use while you're making your lessons. Remember, your kids want to see you. It can be as simple as you want and as extravagant as you want. I'm not making mine super extravagant. I'm just there for the kids. So I hope this video was helpful and I will talk to you soon. Okay, bye.